All right, welcome everybody. This is the RSP Film Room, episode number fifty-nine. And joining me for the first time is is someone that I have you know had the pleasure of knowing for a while now. Who has worked at Dynasty League Football? Who is currently enrolled in the Scouting Academy and has his own show Saturday to Sunday, which he does with Nick Whalen. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Nick. Yeah, Nick Whalen. So um, I'd like to oh, welcome okay. Matt Caraccio to the show. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, it is a pleasure. The film room is looking great. I like what you did with the place. Uh, it's looking really, really beautiful. And yeah, Saturday, Sunday, we also have Mr. Paul Pertichese on there as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're having a lot of fun. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, man, it's my pleasure. This is going to be fun. And and Matt today um, suggested that we we should watch Draven Doral, who is the Wide receiver for LSU. He is a redshirt junior, and we've got a couple of games at draft breakdown um, available to watch. They're both against Mississippi State from 2014, 2015. But I think they should give us a decent enough understanding of some of the things that um, Doral can and can't do, and it and it gives an opportunity for us to just talk about the position of wide receiver, as well as you know how how this position works within this scheme and facing the scheme that he is going to be working against. Um, and so that's kind of what the RSP film room is about, is just having conversations about what we see on film as two guys watch it together. And we're going to watch this again at, at Draft Breakdown. I would suggest that if you're interested in finding up uh, you know, learning more about the players who are going to be heading into this draft and future drafts to check out their site, they provide an excellent service to the community. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make sure that this is brought up, that Matt can see it, and we can get started. Um, and before I do that, though, I'm going to read a little, uh, just a little bit of a disclaimer here for copyright purposes, um, that the videos here posted at the RSP Film Room are not hosted on the server, and the original video content's not considered the property of the RSP Film Room. The videos are considered to be used under the Fair Use Doctrine of the United States Copyright Law, Title 17 U.S. Code Sections 107 through 118, and the videos are used on this site for editorial and educational purposes only, and the RSP Film Room and its staff don't claim ownership of any original video content. The RSP Film Room and its staff don't use these video clips in average advertisements, marketing, or for direct financial gain. All the videos, um, all the video content in each clip is considered owned by the individual broadcast companies. What we're doing is spending an hour long show, really just breaking down a player um, to learn about what he's doing. It's a lot of analysis where we're just rewinding and replaying clips that are really only three to five minutes long in length. Um, and that's the basic deal there. So with that, we are going to get started here and pull up our first game. And Matt, you just let me know if you want me to do half speed or full speed based on how the video quality is playing on your side of the, the screen here, okay? Sure. Okay. So we're going to begin on this play. We've got Doral um, at the outside end of a trip set. This is an 11 personnel set. And... We have the running back on the same side. It's a second and 11 situation to give you some context near midfield. Um, you're looking at a you're looking at what looks to be a, a nickel looking type of alignment in terms of personnel, um, with a cornerback inside over the uh, over the uh, tight end here, and then we have. You know, we have some defensive backs over here where we've got one deep and the one that's playing on Doral looks to be playing a little bit of an outside shade, possibly. Mm -hmm. And so that we're looking at probably some zone likelihoods here um, for Doral. And so we're going to our first play we're going to have is him blocking. You tell me, how's that video quality looking to you? Yeah, that you know the video quality looks pretty good. All right, do you want me to go a little slower? See what it looks like at half speed. Um, actually, I think I think full speed is about where we have to be. I think half speed might be too jumbled on my end. Okay. Okay. So, so from a blocking standpoint, I mean, I like the fact that he's aggressive enough to be one of the first to be the first to strike. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I. I you know, this is on this just one play. I mean, I like his feet are on the ground when he does deliver his hands. Mm -hmm. um, the taking that outside shoulder, I'm kind of wondering about just you know whether or not he meant to do that or that just is the shoulder he got because it just allowed the man inside and 
you well, know, the, you, you know, the concern, and, and you kind of alluded to it on that last play, at the snap of the football, it appears that the cornerback has a slight outside shade. So you're wondering a little bit um, why we didn't maybe just for a moment, um, you know, try to take that inside shoulder as our direction off the line of scrimmage and then explode out towards the sideline. Yeah. Um, that, that would just be a concern of mine. But then again, it is a quick hitting play. We're talking about a screen and it's going to his good, uh, good friend over there, Mr. Balankai Dupree, who's another yeah. up and comer. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, it's one play, but mm-hmm. you, you can certainly see there's some good elements there with that particular block, but mm-hmm. the diagnostic aspect may have been lacking, or maybe he could have been one step more patient to get a little further inside, force it outside, take that inside shoulder and just completely drive him out towards the, you know, the back end here and just filter him out where number 15 would have nothing that he would have to deal with here, you know, because yeah. it this block, these two players that I'm circling here, Doral and the defender, could have been closer to the numbers with yep. him on the inside, peeling him backwards. And now this receiver has the sideline. Yep. But like you said, it's one play. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, all right. Now, here we go again. We've got We've got this defender head up here who is – likely going to be defending more the inside if they do go run we've got our we've got our twin guys outside here we don't see what our secondary is showing but it looks you know when you look at the count of the guys that we have here in this set where it looks like we've got more of a three four looking alignment in terms of the way the men are up and you have your you have a safety over top here i mean we probably have a corner and a safety playing off in in some arrangement here somewhere at least you know, eight to 12 yards off, if not more. Yeah, those multiple college defenses never exactly know what they're doing, huh? Yeah. Now, we'll see it later on here. And there is a defender actually about, I think, about 12 yards off here. And one of the things I do like is, you know, you got Doral. You know, he gets off to a nice start here. It's a, it's a nice, intense break in terms of, you know, driving off the line getting the pads over the toes, over the knees. Definitely a, a, a deep ball. And, and, you know, one thing about that particular play is, you know, when I'm, when I'm watching the wide receivers like, like Doral, um, and I think, Matt, you've pointed to this, and this is something that I know uh, at the Scouting Academy and at several other places, that, that visual of exploding out of his starting block, almost like a sprinter, is kind of that initial burst you're looking for um, off the line of scrimmage, and and I think he has, you know, fairly good body lean. He has that acceleration that we're looking for, and he does that very consistently too. So that's one element of his game that I really like. Yeah, and I think that you know this is a well designed play. Obviously, got the whole defense flowing towards Fournette on this play to the to the left side, and it's a nice play action look. Gives the quarterback plenty of time to just hit it downfield and it looks like that we're going to see here that this defender near the right hash that I'm circling had fallen down on this post. And it just looks like a practice play at this stage. You know, it's nice catch with the hands. Yep. And now we get to see it in that full view. And here's the defender I'm circling on the right. Yep. And we're going to see him on the ground, I think in a moment. Yeah, there he is. Wow. So we don't see what Doral did, but but obviously the you know either the defender just tripped or Doral did something at the top of his stem that that put that guy on the ground and he was certainly covering with his back to the inside of the field and Doral was able to break to the inside so that tells you absolutely yeah that something happened there that was probably favorable of what Doral did. All right, so now we get more blocking here. And, I mean, this is important. I mean, Matt, what do you think? I mean, you know, when you think about receivers in their blocking game, I mean, mm-hmm. what do you? What are some of the things that you think are important to discuss with, with listeners and, and viewers about why it's important to look at receivers in the blocking game, you know, even though that, that's something that maybe, you know, a lot of people who are fans may not care an awful lot about, especially fantasy football people. 
Well, I, I think I think if we work backwards from where these guys are going, which is kind of the NFL, you know, the NFL is, yes, a, a passing league, but a lot of the runs are coming out of gun. And you're seeing a lot more shotgun based runs, which usually indicates some type of zone based blocking scheme at the line of scrimmage or maybe some type of off tackle run with a pulling guard. Um, but the important thing is, is that somebody has to get that edge defender. And even though that edge defender likely the contained player is probably the linebacker, those cornerbacks in today's NFL, you know, can can tackle too. So you need a you need a, a wide receiver that really understands how to be aggressive when they're actually blocking downfield. You need a you know you need a wide receiver who understands some of those fundamentals. And Matt, you pointed to them, some of them being just as simple as you know maintaining a wide base, making first contact, showing that aggression. Because at the next level, it, it's crucial. I mean, you think about players like Anquan Bolden, very good blocker. You know, you think about. Um, Players like, I, I was going back to a player that we might all remember who played a little bit of time with the Eagles. Um, Aurelius Ben was a very good blocker. And that that has a role in a spread gun-based offense. That's how you spring your backs for big gains. So, you know, with Doral, I want to see a little bit heavy-handedness. I want to see some sustained blocking. And that just means really, I think, getting your rear end or your hips into the gap to create that space for the running back. So body positioning, being able to be aggressive at the point of attack, first strike, good low center of gravity, nice base. Those are the things I'm looking for when I'm evaluating, I think, a wide receiver and his blocking ability. Yeah, excellent, excellent stuff. And and certainly a lot of these wide receivers, in order for them to get a foothold in the NFL, they have to be able to play special teams. And you yep. have to be able to block on special teams. That's a great point. You, you know, so this is this is one of these things where it, it gives you an idea of understanding that in order for them, you know, a lot of these guys may be stars in, in college football. And I know that oftentimes when we're watching players that – you know, fans are like, oh, well, these guys are great. They're not going to play special teams. They're going to be they're going to be starters in the NFL. You know, and a lot of this can come from either fans of the team or you just like a guy and you're excited about the fact that you saw him make this just dazzling catch or run through the open field. And it's easy to do that. But we have to understand you should go back. You know, if you're listening to this, you should go back and look at a number of players who, you know, have highlight tapes or highlight videos on YouTube who are playing, who are either not in the NFL or who are playing special teams or are um, journeymen in the NFL who are absolute studs on a college football field. And, and if you can make the correlation to see that really then less than a 10th of a percent of the college athletes actually even make the NFL uh, much less even, you know, and much less even start, then you kind of understand that, why blocking actually is a fundamental core skill that that most players are going to need to have um, in this league, no matter how good they may look catching the ball and that and the like. And you know, I don't want to labor this point too much because I th I agree with you, but I, the one guy that comes to mind that I I'm really uh, I really really think is, uh, but not an outstanding highlight real type of receiver uh, is Brandon LaFell. Even though he's injured currently, he's a great effort player. And he's a player that on every running play for New England was blocking and blocking well. And that's something that I really enjoy about his game when I was looking at him on film. And that's something that I, I really do think is an important part of getting that foothold, like you said, in the NFL. Yeah, Malcolm Floyd. There's another example yep. of a guy who, who you know, I mean, you he's still relevant today, and even fantasy owners know about a guy like Malcolm Floyd, who seems to sneak up into those mm -hmm. into their rankings every year in terms of end of season production. And it's, yep. but he's not a guy that you're going, oh, well, he's a star. You know, right. and, and he didn't start off as a star when he came out at Boise State as there it's more of a special teamer in some regards. So here we go. So we're going to watch this block one more time. I like that he's one of the things I like, Matt, is that he disguises his block first as a route, as if he's trying to set up a release. Right. He gets the hip square right here so he could go either direction. And he tries to stutter and give then this jab step coming up to kind of show the inside, but and then you know, try and get a push. But, you know, I mean, he's 
the defender's far enough back, I think, on this that he's able to give a push, but he's not really able to stick and just control the man in this regard. And when you just shove like that sometimes, it just, you know, you lose control when you make a shove a little too early and you're not really in, in a controlled spot to to do anything. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, a lot of the college defense is also when a player is in zone, and I, I don't believe he was in zone on this particular play, but you have those inside eyes when you're playing the defensive back position. You know, you're making and you're keying off of what's going on in the backfield at times, depending upon the coverage. So, you know, it's quite possible that, you know, this is just a lame duck play kind of waiting, even though there's tremendous yard, pick, you know, picked up on the athleticism of the quarterback here, Brandon Harris, I believe. Um, yeah. So I, I agree with you. That was what I was looking for in the first play was a little bit of that deception. And he showed it here. Yeah. And I like the willingness here. And this is the type of play you often see from speedsters at wide receivers. San Antonio Holmes was very good at this at Ohio state is just coming inside to block the, the, the safety on a play that's going outside or off tackle. And, you know, it's not a hard, hard punch, but it's a decent it's a decent punch and placement. And he and the defender ends up rebounding off the linebacker and falling to the ground. And yeah. we get we get to see a little bit of Fournette in some I wouldn't call it unbelievably tight space, but you know, you get to see a little bit of the niftiness that I know I've wondered whether Fournette has had. And you can see some of some of that in a way that even like a Richard Mendenhall had this kind of niftiness in this type of space. Yeah, he, he's very, I, you know, in tight, tight quarters, you know, uh, Fournette is something that I, I think is a little bit, he's shiftier in tight quarters. In space, I'm, I'm not too sure. But, I mean, I've, as far as the block goes from Doral, I, you know, that's, a, that's also a very nice play design and execution on his part, you know, really trying to give Fournette that one-on-one -on -one matchup that, you know, LSU wants time after time. Go ahead, go ahead Leonard, take on the cornerback. And that's, yep. that's a matchup you want all the time. Absolutely. So, so far, I mean, you know, we've seen three blocks and I think that you've seen, a, you've seen good things from each of those three blocks. You've also seen things that where you could compare, if you're going to compare it to the ultimate standard, it's not there, but you're not going to sit there and say, this guy can't block. You can look at it and say, he can, he can get better. Um, and he shows things that that he can do to help out a team as a perimeter player in the run game. Yeah, I would say he's adequate to solid in terms of blocking at this point. Yeah. And so now we're going to have, I believe, Doral still on the outside here. We've got yep. an inside shade. So we're looking at likely a man coverage look, at least in some part of the field here, right. if it's not the entire part. But with the two men outside, they might be able to pick up something if it's not a, you know, if they, they do something a little bit different here, but we got, we got Darrell going inside. And he does a nice job here of, yes. Of really sticking. I mean, he really sticks with yeah. his man nicely there. We see him picked up here. He gets back to the inside and he's locked in. And that's, that's a solid, solid, solid blocking play for him. I mean, yeah. that's just everything you want to see. Effort. He sustains the block. He just drives the player, the cornerback, the D-back into the ground. And he really creates that play. That's that's Brandon Harris walking back to the huddle and high-fiving your wide receiver. Exactly. Saying, Thank you very much. Exactly. Exactly. Great point. All right. So now we get a stack. Now it comes into a, a jet sweep around the corner here. And you get really get to see a chance of the speed and some of the balance here that he has. And a little bit of love from Fournette again, given. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's his bread and butter right there. That's that's where, you know, that's where LSU, and they still do that this year. If anybody has watched out there some LSU games this year, they this, love this, this. Yeah, and this is this year's game, actually. So. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That is this is 2015. That would yeah. be this year. <laughs> that would be this yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, but that's good. It, it, like you said, it's a great point. It is a bread and butter play for them. And look how quick I like that he corners here. He can corner yes. here fairly fast. 
But he sets up that block. You know what I mean? Like he sets that up because, you know, you talk about this all this time when you're talking about running backs, you talk about pressing the hole. He doesn't overcommit too early. He still takes it out laterally towards the sideline. He gives that illusion with a jet sweep that he's saying, okay, I need to set up my blockers in space in order to create a hole for myself. And once I see it, I'm going to cut up. Yes. And he does that. He does a nice job of that. He really does. I like that the ball's under his outside arm. He does yep. a fairly good job of – it swings a little bit, but when he starts to get around the corner, it gets high and tight. And then, you know, he anticipates – I mean, while he, he can't switch the ball at this stage, it would be impossible to expect him to switch the ball when he's cutting back inside. But he does bring his shoulder in a little bit more so he can dip, which is a nice mm -hmm. technique. And he's able to run through this wrap, and that's a – you know, I mean, that's not power as much as I would say it's balance at, and momentum at full speed, which is still very impressive. You know, I mean, you don't you're not going to expect a guy of his height and weight to be a powerful player. But you do want to see a, a player who's a ball carrier with that kind of speed to to show balance. And he's able to do that, you know, and on this particular play, I mean, you see a little bit of the rigidity though as an athlete you know when he makes that cut up field you know there's a little bit even just a hint of a gather as he begins to make that cut up field which i think you know as you watch a player like him i don't think you see a player who's going to make multiple tacklers miss in open space i mean even on that play you know, you don't see any indication as he sees the, you know, the eminent contact. You see him primarily say, I'm going to use power here. I'm going to try to run through that tackle. I'm not going to try to get cute with this, which I think is a tip to the cap in one way, but also maybe, maybe indicating a little bit of rigidity as in terms of his hip flexion and his ability to kind of break outside or make bigger plays in space. It's just a thought. Yeah, and that's a good thought. It's a thing that it's a good question that needs to be answered further when we watch more tape. And I and I think that's an excellent point to look at. The hips are such an important aspect of it, and I'm, I love that you brought that up in terms of hip flexibility to change direction. A guy like Tyler Lockett, yes, you know, you can see he could bend into a chair. It looked like he sat <laughs> in the chair and cut, you know, cut almost a ninety degree angle coming back and something like this. Yeah, I mean it. It. it the, the, the tentacles of that are just huge, right? I mean, it goes into all your explosiveness in and out of breaks. Yeah, the, everything, everything. Yeah. yeah, and so, I mean, that, and that's something that you'll look for. At the same time, you look at this play and you could say, well, um, you know, that, that's the question. It's still a question that needs to be answered because you can certainly see where maybe it's just this particular play mm -hmm. where it's kind of a bend, you, you know, where you want to continue to bend downhill in a way where you don't want to, you don't want to cut too deeply anyhow, but it's like, but I would say, but I, I think your point is a very good one. I think it's one that, um, that just speaks to, to more things to watch. So let's, let's see what we got more here. We, Yeah, this is a good one to talk about a little bit too. Um, let me get back here. All right, so we got it. We got. You see that Doral's consistently playing the position where he is going to be a few yards off the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably a, you know, one is that you have your, you know, your flankers usually. I believe it's your flanker. Is it your flanker that's usually up, or your your split end that's usually. Up. Usually your split end. I yeah. mean, again, it depends on the modern verbiage. It changes all the time. But yeah, I would say he's yeah. he's in that flanker position, and you have your split end yeah. is what uh, is playing on the opposite side. So he's a flanker, I guess. Yeah, is yeah. How I would classify. I would I would think that makes sense in this particular case too. And it's a, and as a result, but you see him consistently wherever he's lined up. You see him consistently off the line, which can often be a de design by the def by the offense to say, look, we want to give him a little bit of a start not to have to deal with press when he is pressed. I mean, sometimes that happened. They did that at Florida State with Kelvin Benjamin a good bit right. early on in his career or throughout his career there. And you, you, you kind of see a dip to the inside out to start that, that little, yes. that hard mm -hmm. plan yes. stepping out, mm -hmm. but there's really, you know, the defender's ready for it. 
and he gets his hands on Doral first, and Doral tries to kind of swat it down, but the the cornerback does a great job here getting position from the yes. get go. Yeah, he drives him out towards that sideline, and that's something where you notice uh, when you're evaluating receivers, especially, you want to see them be able to hold that position because that's part of the competitiveness that you need at the position, especially at the next level with stronger defensive backs. They're going to drive you out to the sideline. This is not, you know, patty cake. You know, they're going to they're going to get physical with you. You got to be able to hold that that line because as you can see it's probably his first read in this progression. And, you know, it looks like a rhythm throw and he was pretty much just going right into that throw. And, you know, if you know you're the first read in this particular progression, you got to try to at least you know, fight against that with arm, upper body movement, swatting of the hands. And, you know, referees are going to let you play that game. They're going to let you snuggle over there along the sideline. You know, you got to be able to, to hold that as a wide receiver. I also think that maybe he took, he gave a plant step like that too soon because yes. he's so far yes. away. I would like to have seen him take maybe another couple of steps and then make that plan outside or do something where, he would have had to work on Odell Beckham is very good at this Yes, being able to get his hips even. And he did this against Robert Alford a couple of times I saw in Brett Coleman's film room, which is an excellent, excellent series. I would check out on YouTube. Um, but he, he got, he got his hips even so that he could work a little bit further to the inside and make the corner bite inside rather. And that way he couldn't jump out like this. Um, but it's a. Uh, but even then, in some of the games that I saw with with Be plays with Beckham and Robert Alford with that Atlanta New York game, there were times that the corner was able to um, just jump to the outside and and foil Beckham on a number of routes. So it's you know it's just going to happen. This is just, again this is just one of of many plays we'll need to see how he does against press on more than just, than the, this one alone. Yeah, and I, th and I think that's a good point. As you're going through these films with these guys, you know, I was constantly taking notes on the game, and I don't really synthesize my opinion until probably after I've looked at their entire compilation of games because anybody can have a great play. Anybody could have a bad play. It's that what does he do consistently, good or bad, that you're trying to evaluate? Absolutely. And that may not make great for, for great TV for everyone here, you know, that we're not going to give you the instant hot take on, yeah. you, know, on the <laughs> player. you know, I mean, there are some of my guests are going to do that. I mean, some of my guests actually like that um, and, and would like to do that. And I host them in that way. And it's fine to, to have that discussion. Um, but I'm, I'm more with you, Matt, where it's like, look, um, we're going to watch more, we're going to watch more tape of these guys and yes i'll give you a i'll give you where i think this guy is if what we're seeing here is consistent with the rest of it but i'm Correct. going to qualify it that way i mean that's my job is to be and this is our jobs is to be you know diligent about what we're doing here um but if you're you know if you're looking for the Skip Bayless, Stephen A. Smith special, then you know you can go to ESPN and yeah. you can get that. Or and even then, you can get Ron Jaworski telling you that he watched every snap of every throw of every play that that guy did since he was in third grade. And you and and then you can get his take, which is more of still again qualified that he watched everything in the first place rather than basing it on one game. Yeah, and you know, you see, Matt, on this particular play, one thing that I do like about Doral, as I'm pointing at the screen, I, I don't know what I'm thinking about there, but as I'm pointing at the screen, there's one thing I do like about him, and this is something I see it, from receivers, is the ability to become an instantaneous runner. And it kind of goes in direct conflict with what we were saying potentially about him being a little rigid through the hips. You can't be rigid through the hips and still be able to transition from catching the football to running very quickly. You know, so yeah. it makes it makes for an interesting thought to just go back to that and say, hey, I, you know, this is, again, just something you're noting down. Yep. And you see what he, and it is it's about pad level here. And it's also about the willingness. Yep. You know, you got the you got the drive phase here. You got the you got the you, you got a tight, you know, ball security here, pads low and you're attacking through. 
and he almost runs through this rep. I mean, I have a feeling that if he didn't get hit by the two defenders over top at this point, he might have run through um, number 45's rep on that play. Absolutely. He's a strong he's a strong player. That's one thing I noticed about him. He's strong. And this is a and you get to see again. I mean, here's an this this one's a better nicely positioned block. Yep. Um we're going to see him come you know, come inside out. He takes that inside shoulder, which is exactly what you want to see him do. Yep. And you know, if if there weren't other defenders in the area to the inside to to tackle Fournette, if this open area is clear here, what he does here is more than enough to spring this inside crease. Absolutely. He drove that number right to the sideline, that inside number. He just that was his target and he drove it right to the sideline. It's a, you know, it's a bit of a mix up, but he's 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 trying to do his best to diagnose what's going on downfield and you can't right. predict when the running back is going to come through that crease if he ever is. So, you know, that was it's up to it's up to Fournette to do something with with Doral in the area at that stage. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's more on the back, I would say. We don't get a chance to really see this route. But it I does, it does look like there was a collision though at the line of scrimmage, which it looks like he shook off uh, what looked to be a jam um, on the it looked like the outside shoulder. It looked like he was just trying to jam him on the outside shoulder. I mean Again, I'm looking at the footwork, so it yeah, seems like there was collision. Maybe one thing I do know is that I do like that he cuts the route shallow. Yes, and he cuts it more square to the inside on this play, which often you would see if there was a defender to the inside a little bit more, but there wasn't, which also kind of aids your idea of what you're saying of that there was probably a collision here for him to cut it off that sharply inside and bend it unless he bent it because he did see this defender coming off the route, Mm -hmm. you know, but that defender's probably reacting to the throw more than he was reacting to the route. And and if we even project a little bit more, let's say it was a dig, let's say it was like a drag route underneath, or if it was a slant route, um, just the very fact that he had the wherewithal, like you had pointed out, to flatten it out and make a you know a better passing window for his quarterback shows awareness of the situation. Absolutely, and you can see, I like the burst, and we're going to get to see it here. And you're right, he did he did work off the jam here. So, and that's a great. I mean, that's a that's a. You know, that's a bad, <laughs> there's a little bit of a bad jam, but clearly the defender was going after him there. You could see he should have stepped up a little bit, maybe yeah. got that front foot down. But I like the, you know, but he does try and use the one arm as two feet thing, but he just, the defender got fooled to the outside. Yep. You know, and let's see if we can see it a little bit better here. Yeah, I mean, he's playing an inside, inside position, so he he's trying to protect that inside. So this is exact, you know, I mean, He's doing what he's supposed to do to protect that inside, but he gets well. He doesn't really here actually, but it's a he gets fooled, and it, it's a nice job of kind of giving, taking away that one arm, and then coming over the top. I'm just curious, what was his first? What was his first initial burst? Were we looking at something that was right at the breastbone of the defender, or was it slightly outside? I'm just curious because. I wanted to see if he took him outside a little bit or if he didn't. Yeah, I he think, did a little bit? Yeah, I think he did. I actually think he took him outside a little bit. You can see kind of a lean to the outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very nice. It's very nice. And you can, and I like how he used the arms. I mean, again. That's very nice. Stayed clean. Yeah. And let him get up in him. Look how he gives the arm here at one point. And then tucked it back in, and yep. he wanted to swim over the top. Yes, he didn't really need to. Yeah, and you know, and that's and that's very and that was very. I like that you pointed that out, Matt, because the way he tucked that arm in, you get a lot of guys that that get very dramatic with that swim move and expose that inside rib cage to extra contact, and that destroys what they're trying to accomplish. You know, he got he was very compact in his hand movement. 
Yeah. And now he's ready to just yep. attack the ball before it arrives at an early window. Yep. Uh, very nice. All right. So where do we have Dural here? I don't see him. He's on. Is he on the wing over here? I think he's on the wing. Yeah. I. Yeah, he is. No, oh, he's wow. outside. He's yeah, he's outside. outside. Okay. So let's go back just a little bit here. Can't blame LSU. I mean, if you're watching and blocking like we've been, he's he's a strong blocker. I mean, yeah. you're looking at maybe a solid a solid blocker to a good blocker. Yeah, I mean, he's active with his hands. He's maintaining his position with his feet. Yeah, he's he's usually athlete. punching with his feet on the ground, so he's generating that power. Absolutely. Yeah, these are some you know good efforts. Yep. Yeah. Not adequate. I'll give him a solid grade. Definitely. He's definitely looking like, you know, a very competitive effort, high effort blocker with good power. And then it's just a matter of, you know, staying caught. Look, great hand fighting. Yeah. Just really, really working that block. Well done. And again, I mean, he doesn't have to drive him outside towards the sideline. I mean, you yeah. ideally would want that by design, but that's not how it always is in a game. Yeah, and we're not looking for Michael Orr high school videos here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he's Power not, right. He's Power not gonna, right. Yeah, he's not going to drive him out into the stands and onto the bus, you know. Yeah, he'd be playing in between the tackles if he was doing that. I mean, they would, yeah. they would totally change his frame. 6'2", yeah. let's move you inside, big guy. Yeah, that's right. One thing I do notice in this game, and it might just be this game, but I'm going to want to look to see whether he can maintain his feet as a runner when he's trying to make short area moves like this. There are a couple. There, there have been a couple of plays after the catch where he either slips or stumbles, where I would want to see if this is a more consistent thing. We've seen him make some really nice runs where he made a, you know, that that nice move downfield that that was for a touchdown that was called back, but. Uh, but I would want to see a little bit more. Well, I, and I think it goes back to what we were talking about. I mean, it's very, very, we were conflicted. I mean, is this guy, is he rigid through the hips or is he very fluid through the hips? You know, it's, it's still a question mark. Yeah. And the, you know, you could be, you could be fluid enough to bend as a runner. Um, you know, you could be fluid enough to bend as a runner in one way, you know, moving downhill and, and drive and not be fluid in terms of going left to right. You know, yeah. I mean, that's that's certainly an aspect, too, of what, of what we have to look at here. So what do you think? We have time to look at, at the last at Mississippi sure. State game. Let's watch it. This, watch sure, this. I'm excited. Let's go. All right, let's do it. Now, this is last year. So from a context standpoint, um, I don't even think we're looking at the same quarterback. Is this still Brandon Harris? No. 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 So their, their game plan, I mean, Fournette was still – you know, they had that two-headed running attack last year. So, you know, from a context standpoint, they were still pretty much a running team. Um, but they were also willing to take some shots downfield. Yeah. Uh, I believe this throw was just not. No, I don't think it was there. Yeah. It wasn't bad, but. No, it wasn't bad. And it did draw a penalty. Let's see if we get to see the replay and whether whether our man Dan here is uh, upset about nothing. <laughs> Dan McCartney. He's he's fuming on the sideline. Yeah. Yeah, this was a bad play. I mean, I got to side with the defender on this one. Yeah. I mean, there's a little hand fighting there at that aspect. And maybe you just wonder, what was that left arm doing? Yeah. You know, that's the only thing I could think they see. See how it's off camera right now? Yeah. Is it holding it in there? I don't know. I don't know. And the official has the perfect view of it. So, I mean, you're going to have to give the benefit of the doubt to the official here that he's competent, even though we all as fans don't like to, don't like to admit that. And he does try to have to make a one-handed attempt on that. Yeah. So you wonder, you wonder if that left hand is being held I, I don't know. I just don't know. Yep. Got ourselves another reverse. Let's see if we can. Yeah, I mean, this is well. This is well played by Mississippi State. Absolutely. 
not much you're going to look at here. You just like the fact that he's trying to spin out of contact and protect the ball. And, you know, this is the other thing that I always love. You know, I, I like to highlight these things because probably about 10 years ago, you know, I would even be prone to this. I would look at this and go, oh, well, stop the tape. Look here. He's got this nice inside lane here. Why didn't he just cut up inside this lane? You know, and and I think that you, as the more you watch tape, the more you start to understand the flow of how plays go and also the way that um, physically people actually can react <laughs> right, and right, understand yeah. that just because you saw something from this angle, because I, like, I still get commentary from people occasionally. I go, well, he could have cut it back through here, and it's yeah. like, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's a you know, it's a it's a sweet play. It's a reverse, and you know, like his. You're right. I mean, could he cut it back up? But he's hoping the blocks are there, right by the SEC sign. Like he's looking for those blocks to be set up there, and there's just virtually nobody contacting anybody. Yeah. So he's like, I'm running for my life right here. That's yeah. really what I think he's saying. I'm going to try to beat them to the edge. Yeah, and you're running this fast. I mean, this is where I like to entertain people a little bit about this, is if you're one of those guys who's, you know, you're thinking, oh, there's a hole right here that he's going to be able to cut back through somehow. Yeah. If you if you watch it, the, the way that I would argue this to you is to understand that what, even if he sees us here, right here, he's he's running at a speed that he's going to have to, unless he has incredible hip flexibility like Barry Sanders, where he would be able to bend his, take one step with his back foot here, bend his hips and explode downhill without <laughs> these guys coming back and without him like tearing his every ligament in both knees to be able to have stopped at that level of speed, you're not going to be able to plant and cut back and accelerate through here and clear these players one, two, three without getting tackled or falling to the ground. So that's just an answer to, to anybody who may be looking, who's new to this and maybe, you know, go, well, I saw that hole there. He should have seen that. No, he's not, you know, these guys aren't made of ball bearings. You can't just press the RB button on your remote control and spin no. him back up in Madden. Yeah. <laughs> and even Madden's better about it than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's very, it's very, cause they got new offensive line logic, right? I mean, like, uh, there Hey, go. there you go. <laughs> this is a nice route. Yeah, it is. I was just about to say that. I was like, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, he's coming off the line of scrimmage. You see, he's attacking the outside shoulder and that at least puts the court, you know, the D back on his heels. And what he does is he plants with that outside foot because it's a speed cut. You know, he's not doing anything more than that. And he, you see him get immediately parallel to the line of scrimmage with his shoulders, looking back towards the footballs with his hand really ready to make that catch. And he meets the ball in the air. He doesn't wait for it to come into his frame. And he immediately anticipates contact, given where the route is supposed to be over the middle of the field. And he just secures the catch to the ground. He doesn't try to do more than needed. And he understands that the main thing you want to handle here is get the ball, make the reception. And it's just a really nice fluid route that shows awareness, that shows that explosiveness out of his breaks, but also he it shows the refinement in his ability as a receiver to do the technical things correctly, getting that shoulder plane immediately parallel to create the widest target for the quarterback possible. He just does a great job of doing that and then meeting the ball in the air. Could have easily let it come into his frame. A lot of receivers at the college level do that. He doesn't. He goes and gets it. And I think it was a really nice route and takes it to the ground through contact. Yeah, and I would say this. This is a this is a fairly simple route. And yep. the things I especially love, though, is you've at first here. Yes, you're gonna. I I like that he comes off the feet. You know that he comes off the line fairly well the first few steps. Mm -hmm. Driving off's pretty good here. He kind of comes up a little bit. I'm. This is the difference between college and pro, and you're gonna see where. All the things you stated, I totally agree with. I would say from a pro standard, you can also see where he's going to need to learn. And you can see where he's going to need to get better. The drive off here is very good until this next step. And you see him come up, feel a little bit. The arms stop drumming. At yes. this point, an experienced NFL cornerback, 
He's going to, if he sees this is consistently what Doral does on these routes, he's going to jump that crap very quickly because he's going to know that Doral is getting ready to make a turn because he's getting upright. The arms stop drumming as much as they need to. He's no longer going to be attacking downhill. Now, the eyes are downfield, which is good. You want to have those downfield eyes. And then you have the step. Now, that's a pretty good step. You're going to want to see, again, this is a question about the hip flexibility, hip flexibility you said before. A good J step really swings around a little bit more. It can be even a little tighter and a little more sudden. I agree. But that's not, again, we're talking about the difference between a great pro route runner and a, and a very good college route runner and, and a, also a college route runner who could develop into that. So we still... This is, again, with workouts, we may want to see what he can do in a workout or in another game and how he refines it. And this was last year's tape, not what maybe he's done to improve neck, you know, in 2015. But what you said about turning the shoulders and the head, that's great the way he snaps that around. And how can you, and how can you not like the fact that he knows he's going to take on a linebacker here coming square for him and he's got two guys in his sights that he knew that he just turned inside of who are also going to be there to converge on them and, and take that contact. That to me is, it is, that's, that makes this play. That's a, it's a wonderful thing to show that he's not only willing to be physical as a runner and attack or physical as a blocker and attack, but he's willing to take the punishment as well. Yeah. And I, and I think what you alluded to about attacking that vertical cushion on the initial portion of his route is a hundred percent correct because you wonder if, was he what and like you said is he aware that it's zone coverage and if he is still aware it's zone coverage i understand you want to look for those soft spots in the zone but the reality is is that at the next level you're going to be right that that d-back is going to recognize that because as soon as those numbers come up as soon as those numbers when you're when you're defensive back you're reading the numbers right so as soon as those numbers come up and you're showing me your chest i know you're decelerating which means based on my coverage leverage, if I'm inside or outside, the minute I see that happen, I'm poising. I'm, I'm throttling and I'm saying, okay, where are you going? So on the next level, that's going to be tremendous. That's yeah. something he's got to improve on. You can't give that away. Richard Sherman sees this, yeah. starts slowing his steps, and, and he's already like right here driving on Absolutely. this route. And then as the ball arrives... Richard Sherman's about right here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He's up now here. Richard shoulder. Sherman's just caught the ball and may have just taken a hit to the inside shoulder by the linebacker yeah. and either gets, falls down with an interception or spins off that glancing blow and is off to the races with, with the ball in his hand. So, yeah, that's, that's part of And I think that's the thing that this is the magic of – this is the magic of scouting in some regards is – that we have all the technique, we can talk about all the technical skills, and they are so important and vital. But at some point, you also have to take what you see on Sundays and look at all those techniques and when they recognize things and and project what would happen in this situation if number 83 continues to bring this type of game uh, to Sunday. And he's going to learn too. And you have to be able to project whether or not he's going to be able to learn and to do this stuff. But if you see him immediately doing the things that would throw off a Richard Sherman on Sunday, then you know how ready he may be early I on. I agree. Yeah, so. it's great. And I got and I just love that right at the end. I just love that. That that is a separating factor between uh solid NFL average wide receivers and then potentially very good ones is right there. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be willing to do that. Nice play. I mean, really, even the, with the nitpicking aside, oh, yeah. really nice play. Yeah. This is also another nice play. Let's see if we can get further back here. So we see him driving off, at least from that stage. Comes back well to the ball, attacking it. Yep. You don't see that a lot in college, as much as you would like to see. Yeah. Yeah, very true. 
nice little jab, nice little juke outside in. I like to see him carrying the ball under his right arm because I hadn't seen him do that yet. So yeah. it's nice to know that he does carry it well and with good security at either side. Yeah, it's a nice overall play. Yeah, I, I, and that's very projectable. Yeah. Do you want to? Is there anything more you want to elaborate on that, or do you want to go on? No, 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 no. I, I think it's just it's got a like you already pointed out a couple of big projectable factors where he came back to the ball on that route, and I I don't know if it was a curl route or if it was a comeback route. Um, it, it's hard to tell where he turned, um, but either way, uh, he's coming back towards the football and coming back down towards the line of scrimmage, getting that separation, realizing that the separation on that route is at the top of the route, working back towards the line of scrimmage. And that's something you don't see from every college player. So it's nice to know he has that already. And then he has the awareness to immediately react, react and become a runner of the football, which is nice to see because that projects to Sunday. You don't just fall out of sun, you know, you don't just fall out of bounds. You're going to get, you know, that football. And you know what? LSU is down at this point. They're down 17 nothing. There's 240 left. They're on their final drive probably of the half. And it's just nice to see him show that competitive toughness and get out there and make a play. Yeah. Now you could, you know, we could we could also make the argument that it's second and eight, and he's getting a whole lot of cushion on this play. Oh, absolutely. You know, but you know, but especially for a for a corner blitz, you know, defensive blitz, you know, off the off the slot here. But yes, that's right. But there, he there does. Sure. Yeah, I mean, so I would look at this and say, I would look at this and say, this takes nut. This is a great play. This is great work from Doral. Then I would also say, but from the scheme of the play, you're like, this defensive back is too far on his heels and not confident enough about, you know, playing a little bit, should play maybe a little further up. I don't know if he's been told to play here. but There's a lot of pressure, right? There's a lot yeah. of pressure, you're saying? Makes you yeah. wonder if he was just like, just don't give up the big one. Just yeah. don't give up the big one. <laughs> like, yeah. just don't do it. Oh. Up, oh, up! Oh, I'm gonna sit down for a while. I'm gonna sit. Down. I'm sitting down for a while on this one. Sorry, yeah. coach. But you know, it puts them. That was a that was a very good play uh, by Doral and LSU. It was a. It was definitely kept the sticks moving and probably put them into field goal range at this point. Oh, absolutely! Now they're inside the fifteen. They're in, and it's time for you know they're gonna get a chance to make a play here again. So let's see. We got that inside shade. And yeah, I mean he. This is where. Again, we're seeing him struggle being able to to get off contact when he has to deal with contact, and it's and again, it's only two games, but you're seeing once again, he's never really on the line of scrimmage when he's playing, when he's facing press. He his moves don't tend to be very sophisticated with being able to. He's got maybe a jab step and then tries to use an arm. But he's not doing enough to really sell the to get a, a defender moving enough out of a position to where he can win it. Yeah, I agree. He's not. He's not. And you know, at first glance, when you saw him off the line of scrimmage, um, one thing that I was thinking about was, well, maybe maybe the route progression, your timing, obviously the footsteps of the quarterback with the route and how they'll break open. So you're sitting there saying, well, maybe it's that. That's potentially what was going on but now you see it over the course of two years and you're saying yeah it's it there's limitations that the coaching uh you know the coaching team has identified and they're formationing him to give him the best to facilitate the best situation for him by far it's, yeah and certainly the quarterback's under a ton of pressure here even yeah. the throws off probably at this point at this stage but it's but it is something that yeah we we know that we're going to see how much he can learn with dealing with press coverage between this year and next when he gets a shot in the league. And we don't, this, we're going to see this route here, I guess, from this standpoint. Okay. Let's see him up top. Of course, camera angle takes that away, but. Yeah, exactly what we want to see. Great. Take it yeah. all away. Let's see if they'll show a replay of this one. Now now Matt, this is a great this is a great um route to just take a look at, even if we only see the last few frames at the end. 
Oh, they give us everything. Great. And that's where I think, honestly, there's something. That's where I think he's an NFL player is right about here. I think he has to work on that strength, holding that line. He doesn't get any contact, if you notice. Um, so he's off clean. Now he gets some contact. You can automatically see he's getting pushed a little towards the sideline, but he fights back in and he keeps his eyes downfield. He keeps his eyes on the ball and he's able to make that catch in stride and be able to immediately become a runner. You know, it's not like he doesn't have the body control to be able to catch that ball while still moving. Yeah. And I agree with you. He gets, when he gets bullied a little bit here, he's got, both the physical acceleration yep. and the concentration and the late hands on this play too. Yes. He's, he's, you know, he's, he keeps his hands moving, but that's when he extends. So, I mean, yeah, he's, that's a very nice play. That's where I think you're seeing Doral have that, that Sunday potential is right on a play like that. You know, I don't know if he's your everything receiver, but when you're talking about a player that I think has the capacity to win downfield on deep throws, I think he's going to make a team better in the NFL. Maybe he's not a starter. Maybe he's not number one on your fantasy team. Um, but this is where I think his physicality um, as a blocker, as a player overall, and then as his speed, his speed. I mean, they've had unofficial scores of him in the sub four fours. And if that comes to fruition, that he is that quick and that fast, you know, there's going to be a team with his size and speed that that he could make better immediately. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that completely. And I would say that my camera is a little bit jumbled here where I was at. But, um, yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. And and when you look at him, the the team that comes to mind for me, if just on these two these two games we've seen, is – Think about Ted Ginn right now in Carolina. Yeah, you know Ted Ginn. Ted Ginn, obviously, he was a, a higher round pick. I think a first round or second round pick, and he was supposed to be, you know, much more of a primary guy, and it didn't work out for him, um, in the sense that he wasn't very good at catching the ball in tight coverage and and dealing, and he didn't have the greatest hands in terms of technique, and he had things that he had to learn, but. You know, I, I could see Doral being a player that's very much like what how Carolina is using Ted Ginn right now and using him successfully. Um, and he may develop more into that where Doral may be a little better blocker. He might not be as good of a runner. He may not be as good at double moves, but he catches the ball better in traffic than Ginn did when Ginn came out. Um, he also has enough speed and ability to work inside in the ways that Ginn had to develop to do. So... You yeah, know. and I think and I think that was a great point about working inside. He he showed that he showed that toughness on interior routes. He showed that willingness to take a hit and get possession of the football. And and those things, you know, again, you work him off the line of scrimmage, you formation some of those things for him at the next level, and you have a guy that I think is, you know, he's not rocking it out as number one wide receiver on your depth chart, but you're talking about a in a league that's starting three wide receivers, you could see him being functioning as a third wide receiver on your depth chart. You could see that now. You could yeah. even see him developing potentially into more. I mean, who knows what he becomes exactly, but right now I think it's clear he's an NFL player just at what level. I think I think he's a third wide receiver on a depth chart right now. That's where I'd put him. But I do have to ask you, Matt, I have a question for you. How do you analyze guys that play in these run-heavy schemes? I mean, where do you go with that in terms of your analysis of, let's say, a receiver, uh, where the position is just like, you know, you don't get that many reps. You know, we saw, I think, a fair amount, but he, they're not slinging the ball like BYU or, you know, or Baylor. Um, where does that – how does that play into your evaluation? That's a great question. I mean, I think that for me, it means that I find – I'm watching more and more tape of a guy like that because I, I feel like that I want to see as much as I possibly can until I'm at the point where I feel like I'm just watching a loop of the same routes, the same, you know, the same type of things over and over again. But, but I, but I think that as, even as, um, even as Dan Hatman talked about a couple of weeks ago when I had him on the show was that you just keep watching until all the boxes are checked or is, or until you, you, you can't watch anymore and the boxes aren't checked anymore. Yeah. 
you know, and, and you just go, well, I've watched everything I could on this guy and there's three boxes that just aren't checked. I just don't know. You know, right. and and I think that that's where sometimes you have to go and 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 realize you're at a point where you're just like you can feel comfortable saying I don't know, and you won't know either, um, because I've watched everything that there is relevant to be able to watch of him, and and if and if you want to say that you know, and based on what you saw, then either I missed something that I didn't see, um, or you're guessing. <laughs> it's, you know, and yeah. that's that's all you can do. You know, and it's funny, and that's the one thing that I, I think at uh, Scouting Academy and, you know, it is one thing that they, they, you know, Dan really harps on and something that, you know, I've taken a lot to uh, to heart. And, and you mentioned it throughout the analysis is you got to watch a lot of NFL film to project college players better. Because sometimes it's kind of like that malaise. You've watched so much college film that you forget subconsciously that you're comparing really to other college players when you should be thinking about the NFL game. And like we were talking about with that route, you know, you know, Richard Sherman's making a play on that. And you know what? If he's making contact on that play, he's probably dislodging the football early. Even if even if Doral gets his hands up and can make that reception, you could feel that that hand swatting across the top and making that catch infinitely more difficult. Yeah. So Brent Grimes, Brent Grimes isn't giving him that kind of cushion. Brent yep. Grimes is like, oh, I'm in zone. Yeah, sure. Zone for me is you may get a yard or two on me. I, I'm still playing zone, though. It's going to look like man because I can cover Calvin Johnson and get the better of him, and he's two and a half times my size, and I'm still, you know, I'm still going to intercept a ball on Calvin Johnson, you know, yeah. and pick it off underneath. So it's those types of things you constantly – I always look at it as like if you could physically – if you had to physically imagine it and say, look, these, I'm going to have some glasses and I'm going to put on my NFL glasses when I'm watching college tape, like literally thinking, okay, well, I'm watching college tape right now. And there's a, you know, there's three yards of cushion right here with that corner, or he's playing man coverage. And, you know, there's, there's two steps of separation between the receiver and the corner. Now I'm going to put my NFL glasses on, you know, and go, yeah. okay. And I see that now the corner is going to be like glued to him to where like his, that his Jersey is an iron on of the other guy's Jersey while they're running in man coverage. And that, you know, the jumps, the jumps are going to be faster. The, every type of thing that you imagine is going to be accelerated, smarter, more recognition and you just have to try and do that on every play possible. Yeah. And you know, one thing that I'm, I'm doing on my own to try to keep up that kind of lens, because I feel like you can lose it very easily if you don't stay conscious of it is we, we all have the opportunity to get something like game pass or things like that. You know what? I just pick a player that I, that I really like. It could be Dante Moncrief right now. And I just watch all of his routes from this year just to, just to watch him again, watch what he did last year, and just keep that feeling alive of what does it look like to have to struggle against defensive backs and coverage at the next level. So that way I don't fall into that, that trap of saying, you know, Doral's a really great player when it comes to college players, but he's a, he's a, good player maybe maybe above average maybe who knows right now but i have to have that 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 at least sounding board in my mind of what what it's going to look like at that next level so i watch guys i just watch guys yeah absolutely you know i mean i do the same thing and and i think that getting a chance to be a fantasy writer can help aid some of this for me because i i get a chance to you know i'll, I'll watch you know, game rewind. I'll watch some of the all twenty-two, and I'll look at players and and study what study what I see, and sometimes break down. You know, I'm this past week broke down Steve Smith and AJ Green doing you know doing their thing against each other. Um, you know, from week three's game, and broke down two routes that I just put on my blog that just talks about you know how they release you know versus press or how they or how they work at the top of their stem and some of the little things that they do that are, that seem like nothing that turn out to be everything on those routes. So, so yeah, I mean, it's great discussion and Matt, this was very enjoyable. I, you know, I definitely would like to have you on again oh, um, as we go through the rotation of guys that we've got and, and you have, you know, I think you brought up some excellent points and Matt, can you tell everybody where people should follow you? 
Sure. So you can find me on Twitter at Matty, M-A-T-T-Y underscore O-S. And uh, I'll be doing a lot of uh, broadcasts with uh, my partners in crime, Nick Whalen and Paul Pertichese. And we'll be doing a lot of that at Saturday to Sunday football uh, podcast. We have a website. You come and check us out at Saturday to Sunday football dot com. A couple things going on you guys could enjoy. Uh, we're doing, doing a water cooler on the weekly and it's just literally some hot takes. Uh, that's exactly how I'll frame it. So I am not responsible. Disclaimer, I am not responsible for any of my hot takes. Okay. They're made in a passionate total, just like, you know, here I go, you know, so please don't, you know, if I call Leonard Fournette the next AP, um, you know, I didn't say that or did I? Depends if it works out that way. I said it. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but these are some hot takes uh, that we do on college football, and uh, the website's evolving. So check us out there, and of course you could subscribe to the Saturday to Sunday fo- uh, football podcast uh, at Saturday to Sunday football dot com. We have links there for uh, iTunes as well as for those of you uh, who have uh, Android telephones, and um, you could follow us at uh, Saturday S two S football. Uh, on Twitter and uh, great stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Well, once again, for Matt Caraccio and Matt Waldman, thanks again for watching this week's film room and stay tuned. See you later.